So I'm Michelle Mazurk. I'm an assistant professor in the department, and I work on human-centered security and privacy research um, with uh, more broadly in MC2 and specifically with my group, which is SP2 Security, Privacy, and People. So, um, so we think about human-centered security and privacy. We're trying to answer uh, some sort of, uh, in smaller aspects, we're trying to answer some big questions, like why and how do people make security and privacy relevant decisions? And uh, how can we improve those things or make those decisions go better for varying definitions of better? And of course, when we talk about people, we often think about end users. But uh, it turns out software developers and sysadmins and software testers are also people. Uh, so we can apply some of these same types of methods and ideas to those classes of people as well. Uh, and to do this, we, uh, we often apply sort of a combination of uh, traditional computer science topics and methods with some methods that we borrow from social science. Uh, so we do surveys and interviews. We do observational studies. Uh, we conduct controlled experiments in the lab in an online setting. Uh, we do system designs. We build interventions. And then we test these interventions to see how they improve people's decision-making processes or don't. Um, and we also use tools from data science, content analysis, NLP uh, to, uh, to get at um, what people are thinking, how they make decisions, and what the barriers are to uh, allowing systems and procedures to improve. So I'll give you some examples. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on understanding and measuring the ecosystem of security advice. OK, so who here has ever received some advice about how to do computer security better, like how to make a better password or to sort of update your antivirus sometime, right? OK. Now, who here has listened to all of the security advice you've ever received? Who here has listened to most of the security advice you've ever received? Maybe, kind of. OK, so, uh, so you probably know that if you tried to listen to all of this advice, you might have to like give up using electronics and go live in a cave, right? There's probably no other way to make this work. Um, so, so we were curious about sort of understanding this ecosystem and how we can maybe improve it. So we've done a lot of work to understand where are people actually getting this advice. Uh, and it turns out, as some of you probably know, because you probably provide this advice, they're getting it from their uh, friends and neighbors who are considered to be sort of the IT tech savvy people, right? Some people in this room have probably had that experience. Um, they're getting it from uh, corporate training that they get at work. They're getting it from librarians. Uh, they're getting it from service providers, such as Comcast or AT&T or Verizon. They're getting it from websites, all these places. Um, and uh, in addition, sort of why uh, we looked at why people accept some of this advice and reject others of it. Uh, it turns out there are a lot of reasons. Uh, people always think the main reason is going to be because it's too inconvenient to implement the advice. That's certainly true sometimes, but it's far from the only reason. There are also things like being worried that implementing security advice will impact your privacy or will create other kinds of problems for you. Uh, and then most recently, we've been trying to understand what actually is all the advice that's out there. So we scraped uh, over a 1,000 documents of security advice from the web, and then we analyzed them with a combination of manual coding and NLP techniques. Uh, it turns out we identified 400 unique advice imperatives, so only 400 simple things you need to do in order to keep yourself safe online. Uh, and then we asked a lot of people sort of uh, which ones they thought were a good idea. Turns out. Experts love advice, so like 390 of these 400 things were considered to be useful things to do. Uh, so as you can see, we have a little work to do to, uh, to improve this ecosystem and, and try to make this better for people, because most of us probably don't have time in our day to try to implement 390 different uh, unique pieces of, of security advice. Um, and uh, we published a bunch, of, a bunch of papers on this topic. Um, Another topic we've been looking into, uh, and this is partially with Mike Hicks, who was just here, is understanding why developers write insecure code. Uh, so, so a lot of times, uh, there's kind of a pervasive attitude of like, those developers, why can't they just get it right? Like, why do they still mess these things up all the time? Uh, it turns out, like, actually, uh, systems govern the way that people behave, right? And if you don't fix the system, just asking individual humans to do a better job all the time is probably not going to work. So we want to understand the systematic factors that cause these problems. Um, so we, we did one study looking at information resources, uh, actually a couple of studies, and discovered that um, uh, insecure code appears on Stack Overflow, becomes a convenient, easy way to solve a problem that you might have, like 
uh, it will make your exception go away, possibly by making your entire system insecure, but hey, your exception went away, so super, uh, and then disseminates from Stack Overflow out into lots of real world code. Uh, we also took a look at simplified crypto APIs, um, so how can we change uh, and improve crypto APIs to help people avoid making crypto mistakes, even if they're not expert cryptographers themselves. Um, we're also trying to understand uh, using different vantage points, including lab studies and the secure programming contest that we run uh, to understand uh, why and how and what kinds of mistakes people make. Uh, and it turns out a lot of the tools we have for spotting security problems are good at finding what we'll call mistakes, uh, not so good at finding conceptual errors. It turns out conceptual errors are in fact the much larger source of problems. Um, so we need to sort of realign some of our tool base a little bit to get at some of these problems. Uh, and we have some upcoming work trying to understand uh, barriers and goals in trying to uh, transition from things like C to type safe languages, things like Rust. Um, we are also doing a lot of work with other kinds of information workers, um, not just developers, but also sysadmins and software testers. Um, we took a look at understanding how the processes and procedures of software testers are different from vulnerability analysts. These are two groups of people who are both charged with finding bugs. Uh, it turns out not as different as you might think. Their processes are actually heavily similar except in a few key areas. Uh, we were able to uh, embed one of my students at the New York City Cyber Command, which is the city agency charged with protecting all of the digital infrastructure in New York City uh, to test out threat modeling methodologies. Uh, at an actual enterprise scale, and it turns out that, um, at least in our case study, they actually work pretty well, which uh, I think came as a surprise to several people who were involved. Um, we are building up theoretical models of how reverse engineers do their work so that we can design and develop um, new tools that will better fit with the processes for these things. Uh, and we're currently analyzing some data uh, where we partner with a company that uses CTFs to train their developers to find out whether are CTFs uh, capture the flag contest just kind of fun or do they actually also provide good security training benefits to, um, to the people who participate in them? Uh, and then just a few you know, other random sorts of one-offs. Uh, we spending, we spend, do some work on privacy around sort of transparency and online tracking and behavioral advertising. So do you know how you're being tracked and what can be inferred about you from these uh, various ways. We've also done a lot of work in mental models for encrypted communication. So uh, if you are trying to send some sensitive content, do you understand how to send it securely and what does it mean and what is the threat model uh, for these kinds of and how to help people understand how to choose a secure communication channel. Uh, we've looked at credibility on Twitter. So how does, for example, the little blue check mark affect people's uh, tendency to believe or not believe in the content that they see. Um, branching out a little bit into algorithmic fairness and in particular uh, explaining issues of fairness and discrimination to people who will be affected by these systems uh, and, and to allow them to uh, give feedback and to be involved in the process. Um, and we're using tools from program analysis and uh, collaborations with PL people to, um, to identify uh, and explain unexpected or inappropriate permission uses in, for example, Android systems. So uh, if it's using, if, if your phone is, is using the microphone permission, is it using it like when you are asking it to do something or is it just sort of picking up ambient noise around you, right? Uh, and just listening to you so we can use these kinds of tools and techniques. Um, so just to sum up, uh, we do a lot of work in, uh, in my group around answering questions about how people make decisions about, uh, about privacy and security issues, what they think about these ideas, how we can build better tools and interventions to help these decisions go better. Um, we have a lot of fun doing this uh, and we apply you know, a very interdisciplinary approach that takes uh, some of the best tools from CS and some of the best tools from, from social science to put these things together. Uh, I will be teaching in the spring a graduate class on this topic. Um, it has historically been 818D. It might finally get a permanent number, we'll see, um, uh, called uh, Human Factors in Security and Privacy, um, where we read a lot of papers uh, from this literature, this human-centered security literature, uh, and also do class projects, which occasionally turn into published papers and posters uh, and allow people do, to, to do fun things like um, 
like ask people about uh, about privacy concerns for their uh, for related to genetic testing services and other kinds of things. So um, I think I'm out of time. So I'll leave it there.